Hi. Thanks so much for inviting me. This has been fun. What, a, what an interesting uh, bunch of talks. Oops, did I lose my connection here? Uh, I don't know why it went away. Uh, oh, because I bumped into it. Uh, before I get started, I want to just mention that I have a, a website where I've put uh, videotapes of lots of short talks I've given here. It's called Nancy's Brain Talks, and so if you have questions about some of the stuff I talk about today or want to investigate it further, there's lots of stuff there, and it's intended for a broad audience with no particular background. Okay, so um, we've been hearing a lot today about how we might reverse engineer the human brain and some of the difficulties in trying to do that. Uh, and I want to follow that thread by saying, let's consider uh, what we can learn about the design of intelligent systems by looking at the best one around. That's this one here. Same idea you've been hearing multiple times here. But I'm going to look at it at a very different scale. I'm going to ask the question of what is the overall macroscopic organization or design of the human brain? Uh, and I want to start by mentioning an important uh, engineering principle that was offered by um, uh, a, the, the late and great David Marr, who bridged uh, computer science and neuroscience long before other people knew that was a trendy thing to try to do. Uh, and Marr wrote uh, about something he called the principle of modular design. So he says, the idea that a large computation can be split up and implemented as a collection of parts that are near, as nearly independent of one another as the overall task allows is so important that I was moved to elevate it to a principle, the principle of modular design. The existence of a modular organization of the human visual processor proves that different types of information can be analyzed in isolation. So that idea is actually very familiar. It's already come up a bunch of times here, but let me just review some of the ways in which uh, modular design makes sense in engineering and, as I'll argue, also in brains. So first of all, if you have different parts of your system solving different parts of a problem, they can do their thing at the same time. So parallel processing is efficient. Uh, second, if you have different parts of your system solving different parts of the problem, each of them can be specialized to a greater degree for the particular problem they solve. So I can be a better neuroscientist given that I don't also have to specialize in you know, sociology and naval history and God knows what else, uh, but I get to do just one thing, right? And same applies in engineering and brains. And of course, that's not a new idea. That's how universities are organized and societies uh, and companies division of labor. It's also what evolution does, both at the level of genes and also, interestingly, probably at the level of uh, whole regions of the brain. Copy, paste, edit. Okay, so that's a powerful system. It's also how people write grants, some of us. <laughs> um, and all of this is, of course, also seen in engineering. Okay, so modular design is how we build things. It's how we can have maximum flexibility. You can mess with one part of the system without having everything else fall apart. Uh, and it's also maximally understandable. You can understand a complicated system better if, it, if you can break it down into a number of parts. So those are all the reasons why modular design is often a good thing. And so today I'll ask how modular is the human mind and brain? Uh, and which specific mental functions are modular? Uh, and I'll try to hint at why, although I can't answer that. I think it's one of the most interesting questions. Um, okay, so there's lots of ways uh, to address this question, lots of different methods for approaching it, but a particularly good tool for this kind of question is functional MRI. Uh, and the main advantage of functional MRI is it has the best spatial resolution that's available non-invasively to look at the whole human brain in vivo, okay? Uh, and even so, uh, its spatial resolution is appalling compared to the stuff that Jeff talked about. So just as a harsh dose of reality, a single pixel or, uh, or 3D, 3D pixel or voxel in a typical MRI image contains hundreds of thousands of neurons or 10 billion synapses. So the real miracle of functional MRI is that we ever see anything at all. Um, but we do. So just to give you the, uh, a concrete sense of how this goes, let me tell you about one of the first experiments I did around 20 years ago, how we can use functional MRI to look at the organization of the human brain. So we wanted to know, are there special bits of the brain for face recognition? So we went in and scanned people's brains, um, the whole brain through a series of slices, while they looked at a bunch of faces and while they looked at a bunch of objects. And we asked whether the activity 
the brightness of each pixel, which is correlated with neural activity in this method, um, was higher in any of those pixels when they were looking at faces than when they were looking at objects. And what you find when you do that is something like this. This is a horizontal view through the bottom of the brain. This is the back down here. Uh, right and left are flipped. Um, and that little patch, the statistics are telling us that that region responded more during viewing of faces than objects. Okay, so there's lots of ways to cheat, uh, but to show you that I wasn't cheating, let me show you the raw data coming from that patch of brain. This is the time course of the MRI response in that part of the brain over a five and a half minute scan when the subject was looking at faces here, objects, staring at a dot, faces, dot, objects, and so forth. And you see that the signal is just much higher uh, when that person was looking at faces than objects. Okay, so uh, we see something like this in virtually all subjects. Um, that exact region, in me, it's right about in there. I'll show you it in my brain in a second. Uh, in everybody, it's somewhere back there, but its exact location varies from subject to subject. Um, so in order to study it, the method we use is to first run a scan like this, takes about 10 minutes, find that thing in that subject, and then once we've found it, we can get sophisticated, or more sophisticated, and ask more questions by testing the response of that region once we've identified it, okay? So having done that for about 10 years, here's a sort of summary slide. Uh, here are four different subjects' uh, face areas. That's me, and these are all in horizontal slices. So just to point out a few things, if you haven't seen this before, raise your hand if you can tell what this image is right here, next to the cursor. Good, no one? Okay, raise your hand if you can tell what this image is here, right next to the cursor. Good, if you didn't get it, don't worry, it's not a problem, uh, it's a little subtle. It's a side view of a face, eyes, nose, mouth, got it? Okay, so this image is actually the same as that one. This one's just upside down. And so you mostly, you guys mostly see the face here and don't see it there. Actually, even now that you know that, it's hard to see. And that's an effect that's been known for 30 years in psychology, that face recognition is particularly sensitive to inversion of the stimulus. That's useful because we can use it to say, let's measure the response in that face area when people look at upright faces versus inverted faces because the visual properties of those stimuli are virtually identical. So all my hardcore vision friends who want to say, oh, it's just a spatial frequency, it's this kind of energy, it's that kind of mathematical property of the, uh, of the image, well, no, this is the same image, it's just upside down, and yet the response in this region is much higher when people see the face than when they don't. And the other images just show you a variety of ways in which it generalizes to lots of different kinds of face images and responds much less to lots of non-face images. Okay, so all of that says this thing really responds more to faces, much more than to anything else. Okay, so it's selective for faces. Um, but there's an important critique. So I want to say that this thing is all and only for face recognition. That's a simple-minded story, and we should start with a simple-minded story until the data forces us to say something more complicated. But there have been many critiques of this idea, and most of them are just definitively wrong. Um, but one of them is smart and still in play. And that's a critique uh, that uh, came from Jim Haxby, actually an earlier version of it came from David Cox, actually, who was very ahead of the game on this. Uh, and that is that this region contains information about other things besides faces. So if you look at the pattern of response across the voxels in that region, and you apply even simple math or machine learning, to ask what information is contained in that pattern, often you can read out information about things other than faces. So the point is, okay, there's other stuff that's represented in there beyond faces. So that's an important critique. Um, however, because uh, we care more about information than just what it responds more to, right? However, really what we wanna know is not just what information is in there, but what information is being read out of that part of the brain by the rest of the brain. What is, it, what is its causal role in behavior? What is it used for? What functions would you lose if you lost that part of the brain? Okay, so that's generally hard to answer, but there are rare circumstances uh, when you can get really uh, powerful insights into this. So this guy um, was uh, studied by some colleagues of mine, Joseph Parvizi and Kalani Grill Spector, and he had intractable epilepsy. And so the, of the pr small percent of people whose epilepsy does not respond sufficiently to drugs, the only option is neurosurgery. And so in those cases, uh, patients have uh, electrodes put across often pretty, pretty wide swaths of brain 
so that neurosurgeons can uh, record from those locations to find the locus of the epileptic seizure, seizure and to map out functions in the brain. In a very few cases, those patients allow the neurosurgeons to also stimulate at one or more of those electrodes to see what the patient experiences. So this guy had been scanned by Colony Grill Spectre. They found, they found his fusiform face area, and by chance, he had electrodes sitting right on top of it. So I'm gonna show you what happens when they stimulate uh, this guy's brain right on top of his fusiform face area, because that's a way to find out what the causal role of that region is. Okay, so we need the audio here. Okay, just look at my face. That's the neurologist talking. And tell talking me what again. happens when I do this, all right? One, two, it's a sham three. stimulation. Nothing. Nothing? Okay. I'm going to do it one more time. Look at my face. One, two, Four milliamps. three. You just turned into somebody else. Tell me Your about face it. metamorphosis. Your nose got saggy, went to the left. You almost looked like somebody I'd seen before, but somebody different. That was a trip. Well, it's a trip for me, too, because it's the most powerful kind of evidence you can imagine that that region is actually causally involved in face perception. However, Jim Haxby's critique, and many other people's, he's just the most articulate spokesperson of this, uh, is not really engaged by this. He says, I think that region is also involved in the perception of other things besides faces. So to find out about that, we need to do this experiment while this patient is looking, or while a similar patient is looking at other things. And there was a shred of data in this, in this uh, paper, but not very much. So last October, when I got a phone call from a colleague of mine saying, uh, one of my students is flying to Japan right now, and there's a patient who has electrodes right along his fusiform gyrus in both hemispheres, and they're going to stimulate. Would you like to collaborate? I was like, yes. <laughs> um, and so... Just look oops, at my face. Sorry. Oops. Um, and so this is a bottom view of this guy's brain. I'll show you him in a minute. And this is the fusiform gyrus. The face area is right about there. Um, and so what I asked them to do is I said, listen, you want to replicate that effect when the patient's looking at faces. We need to know that replicates. But what I want to know is what happens when you stimulate that face selective patch when the patient is looking at other things that aren't faces. Is that reason, region causally involved in perception of other things? So show him some round objects in case it's only for face-like things. Show him some square objects to see if it generalizes. And what the hell, show him some words, or since he's Japanese, show him some kanji. Okay, so I'm going to show you the videotape um, of this patient. It's, there are subtitles at the bottom because he's speaking Japanese. And uh, here we go. He's looking at a box. And that's where he's stimulated. You see it down there. Right here is getting stimulated. No change. あの、横に、なんか、目、目、口って感じで、ちょっと一瞬見えたんですけど、これ、なんかなと思ってたら、気がついたらもう、この箱にしか見えないっていうか。ちょっと、これ。
アニメでアニメでできそうな感じのキャラクターの顔みんなみんなに変わったんですし、うん、はい、はい、口は口はそんなに変わってなかったんですけど鼻目こんな感じでしたね。お願いします。毎回一つはちょっとビーチェンジっていうカトンフェイス、スペシャリーアイセンノーズ。はい、そう。So parts of your face become animated. そう、アニメ。If he's looking at a kanji, it's hard to see. It's foreshortened right there. He's getting stimulated there. One more time. Stimulation. やっぱり顔に見えますね。目、目、こちらへんって感じかな。な、アイス、ヘ、マウス。これもよくわかんないのが、な,なんかアニメのキャラクターみたいな顔を、カトゥン、フェイス、カトゥン。OK、You get the idea. The, the import of this is that stimulating that region does affect the perception of other things besides faces, but it does it by putting faces on top of them. So you kind of couldn't ask for stronger evidence, at least from this small data set, uh, that this region is really very specifically involved in, in the visual perception of faces. Okay. Uh, so my argument is, okay, there may be information in there about other things, but As far as we can tell, it's only involved in representing faces. Okay, so I, I talked about the face area in some detail to give you the kind of sense of the evidence for specialization. Let me um, do this more briefly now. This is my brain uh, with a bunch of different regions that we've scanned me on. Uh, and so you see the face selective regions in red, that uh, kind of chartreuse. Those are regions that respond selectively to images of bodies and body parts. The、uh, darker green regions in there, those are place selective when you look at the spatial layout of a scene. You get that. The yellow patch responds to visual motion.、Um, the purple patches, which, which will come around in a second on the bottom of the brain,、um, are involved in processing color.、Um, the、uh, pink ones, which are in the left hemisphere, they're about to come around, are, are regions that are selectively involved in、uh, representing language and understanding the meaning of a sentence. Uh, and the most astonishing one is this turquoise one there. That one is very specifically involved in thinking about what another person is thinking. Okay, so these are pretty cool in all kinds of respects. Let me just point out a couple of things. Those pink regions have been known since Broca and Wernicke about 200 years that those are approximately the brain regions that are involved in processing language. But what we can do with functional MRI is identify them in an individual subject and test them in a whole bunch of different conditions to ask do we really have brain regions that are extremely selectively involved in processing language, or do they participate in lots of other cognitive tasks? This is another version of the question of what is the relationship between language and thought? Are those separate things, or are they so、uh, intimately connected that there's no separating them? Well, our data show very clearly that they are very separable. These regions respond when you understand the meaning of a sentence, but they produce essentially no response whatsoever when you do arithmetic, when you hold、uh, spatial locations or even numbers in working memory, when you listen to music, when you do a whole host of other complex cognitive tasks that strongly activate the brain, but nearby, not right there. And that notion that language is really separate in the brain from lots of other cognitive functions has been shown. This is work by my、um, former postdoc, Ev Fedorenko,、uh, and with her collaborator, Rosemary Varley.、Uh, uh, Rosemary has been testing patients with global aphasia. These are people who have the horrible misfortune of having massive strokes to their left hemisphere that pretty much knock out all of those language regions. And that's a horrible tragedy, but the interesting thing that Varley discovers. Is that those people, if you figure out how to communicate them, with them, which is tricky but not at all impossible,、uh, although they have essentially no language, they can perform arithmetic, they appreciate music, they can do logic problems, they can think about what other people are thinking, and pretty much every high level complex cognitive task that you might think would be connected to language isn't because they can do it.
So that shows an astonishing degree of functional specialization in that case for language. I already remember, mentioned Rebecca Sachs's um, uh, and other people's, but especially Rebecca's work on the specialization of this region for thinking about other people's thoughts, something that actually we do all the time and that is fundamental to what it is to be a human being. I also want to mention these white regions, although I'm excited about and particularly interested in parts of the brain that carry out very specific functions, there are also brain regions that are essentially the opposite, the kind of disreputable brain regions that will be engaged in pretty much any difficult task whatsoever. Uh, and here they are in my brain in these white regions, big patches of frontal and parietal cortex that just seem to be the kind of, I don't know, the CPU of the brain or something. Okay, so the basic picture here is that the human brain contains a set of highly specialized components, each solving a different and specific problem. And each of these regions is present in essentially every normal subject. I could pop any of you in the scanner and get a map pretty much like that. The exact locations would vary slightly, but all of you would have each of these regions. And I think of these regions as just basic components of the human mind and brain. But this picture raises a whole bunch of questions, uh, especially this one. Which mental functions get their own private patch of real estate in the brain, and why those, and apparently not others? As I said, I'm not gonna answer that, but I'll dance around it a little bit. Okay, so first of all, I don't think everything important uh, that we do gets a patch in the brain. We've looked for all kinds of mental functions that seem a priori as likely as anything else, and just not found them. We don't see brain specializations for perceiving food or predators or weapons or all kinds of stuff that you might think would be really evolutionarily important. Um, so you might think, well, um, do we only have uh, uh, specializations for things that have long-standing evolutionary significance? Um, well, that's a reasonable idea, but it turns out to be wrong. Uh, there's at least one region called the visual word form area. It's on the bottom of the brain in there. And that region responds strongly and selectively to words and letters presented visually, but only in an orthography you know, right? So we tested people who either read both English and Hebrew, and in those people it responds strongly to both, but not to Chinese. And in people who read only English, it responds strongly to English, but not to Hebrew or Chinese. And similarly, my postdoc Zainab Sagan has been looking at the development of this region. And she shows that in eight-year-olds who've recently learned to read, here's the response of that region to visually presented words and much lower to other things like faces and objects. She then aligns those data from eight-year-olds to the same data or the same kind of experiment collected from the same kids when they were five before they learned to read. And she looks at the magnitude of response of that region before the kids learned to read and it's not selective at all. In another line of work, I don't have time to detail here, she's shown that what's special about that region at age five is the connectivity of that region to other parts of the brain. That's what predicts exactly where this thing will land. Okay, so this shows something that Jeff mentioned, that many aspects of the brain are crafted by that individual's experience, and that's decidedly true for the visual word form area. Okay, so to answer this question about which mental functions get their own patch in the brain, we need some more examples. So let me step back and say there's a problem with the approach that I've been describing so far, which is we sit around and we think stuff up and we say, oh, faces, bodies, places, what the hell, let's try it and see. And that's fun and it's taken us pretty far, but the problem is um, what if the relevant parts of brain organization are just not things that we would think to test? Who says that our imaginations should be able to come up with the relevant parts of brain organization? So this is where um, one aspect of computer science uh, is relevant, and that is in the data analysis. So we've recently been using new methods that um, are basically fancy math that looks at the data and looks for structure in big data sets, even when we don't provide a specific hypothesis. And I used to think this is something that people did when they didn't have ideas, uh, but now I've really fallen in love with this, and I, I think I see it as like the most powerful way if you discover things with this method when you don't even bring to it your own hypothesis, that's a much more powerful discovery. So let me tell you about an experiment that we've been doing uh, of this ilk. Uh, so this is work on auditory cortex uh, done with my colleague Josh McDermott uh, and my um, uh, gr then grad student, now postdoc, Sam Norman Hegner. And so, 
Auditory cortex is fun to look at because much less is known about it than visual cortex, and so you don't have to read a million papers before you get to play. You just, you know, read three and you're all set. Um, no, not quite. Um, so some things are known about it. Basic primary auditory cortex uh, have, have maps of frequency space. So this has been known, you know, from animals for many decades, and it's been seen in humans for about 20 years. Here's one subject, high, low, high frequency, just playing pure tones, so that's called tonotopy, or a map of frequency space. So that's widely replicated and uncontroversial. But what about all the higher level uh, organization of other aspects of auditory cortex? There are lots of proposals, and they're all kind of disputed and in play, and there's really not much consensus about organization of auditory cortex beyond tonotopy. So we decided to take a different approach. We made a list of pretty much all of the common sounds that you hear frequently and that you can easily identify. And let me play some it's of them for you. It's supposed to either rain or snow. Okay, so this is, we put them on the web and asked uh, how often people hear these sounds. Interestingly, the number one most Anna commonly heard sound is man speaking. Look at number five, woman speaking. What can you do? You see that in this conference as well. Um, it's life. Okay, so that's the basic idea, that's our design. Um, and um, we scan people while they listen to each of these sounds. And so then what we end up with is that in, um, for each pixel and broader auditory cortex, we get a, um, a measure of the magnitude of response of that pixel to each of the 165 sounds we tested. Okay, so that's the response of one voxel and another voxel and another voxel. Okay, so you scan 10 subjects, and you look in this whole broader region, and you get this big matrix, 165 sounds by 11,000 uh, voxels across 10 subjects. We just throw them all in a bag, okay? So now what I love about this analysis is that we throw away the labels and we just analyze the matrix, okay? So that, the, the analysis of these data knows nothing about which sounds are in here and where those voxels are in the brain. It just says, we just say, what's the structure in this matrix? Okay? And what's beautiful about that is that has no prior hypothesis about the anatomical structure, whether any relevant structure we find will be spatially clustered or smeared all over the place, and it has no prior hypothesis about the particular kinds of functional responses we'll see. It's just completely open to whatever, you know, whatever's actually in the data. So the actual analysis we do is a variant of independent component analysis. It just looks for basic structure in here. I just said this. Um, and so what do we see? Well, what we see is that six simple components explain the vast majority of the data um, in this data set. And the four of them are interesting but not particularly surprising. I'm going to tell you about my two favorites, okay? So, and these things just pop out of the analysis and then we stick the labels back on them once they pop out to try to figure out what they are. So here's component five. And this is the magnitude of response of that component to the, each of the 165 sounds. They are color-coded by a bunch of basic categories of sounds. We had people attach these labels on Mechanical Turk. Uh, and what you see is a lot of uh, green stuff up there, okay? Um, and so if we average uh, by these categories, what you see is that this component produces a high response when people listen to foreign speech that they can't understand and to English speech that they can and it has an intermediate, reasonably high, but not quite as high response to vocal music with lyrics. And it's much lower to everything else. So um, this is a speech component, right, very clearly. By speech, I mean the sounds of speech, not the meaning of language, because it doesn't care if it's a language you understand or not. It cares about the difference between a ba and a pa, right? So this is, you know, we have to do this, you have to do this right now to understand what I'm saying, and apparently you have a whole piece of cortex to pick apart the precise phonemes coming out of my mouth to know what each sound is so you can put them together. So that's pretty cool. Actually, a few papers had, had uh, pretty much claimed something like this before. Their data weren't quite as strong, but they were pretty good. So this was nice that it popped out, but not a totally radical discovery. But component six is really new, and here's component six. If you look at its colors, there's a lot of dark blue and light blue. And if you average over those, you see it produces a high response to instrumental music and music with vocals. 
And let me uh, mention that this music is an extremely broad mix, mix of different kinds of music. It's like classical symphonies, pop music, an individual harp, a person singing, all of these, you know, wild drum rolls. The drum roll is high in there. It's not just melodies, it's also rhythm, apparently. So anything that most people would agree uh, is music produces a strong response in there compared to anything else. And this result is truly astonishing. For, for one reason, because nobody even knows why we have music in the first place. Nobody really knows what its evolutionary function is. And also, our subjects were not trained musicians. These are just regular people. And so this is not something that get tra gets trained up if you spend your life being a musician. This is just part of the basic equipment that all of us have in our brains. It's part of what it is to be a human being, is to have a whole batch of neurons, a lot of them, or we wouldn't see them, allocated to this problem. Okay. So I've argued that in addition to these other regions I described before, there are special purpose bits in there uh, for perce auditorily perceiving music and speech. Uh, now, I skipped over some of the details of the math that went into this, uh, but I'll just say we have to sort of mathematically infer these components. You don't see those responses in the raw data. So that's nice, but I like to see things in raw data. So we also ran this, two minutes, okay, we also ran the same experiment um, uh, on patients who had electrodes in their brains, um, like the patients I showed you before, and we recorded. And here's the response um, in one electrode in one subject. It's a little hard to see, but the raw data here are showing us whopping selectivity for music, and this other electrode, whopping selectivity for speech. So that means it's not just a possibly flawed mathematical inference. It's actually in there in those rare cases where you have the spatial resolution to really see it. You can see it in the raw data. The other thing I love about these two functions, speech and music, is that they're both uniquely human. And that makes them uh, both more interesting to me. It's you know, something we want to most know about our own minds and brains. Uh, but it also means it makes sense to study these with functional MRI rather than the usually much more powerful methods available with animals. These guys, you can't really study in animal models. Okay, so just to recap, I started with this question of what is the overall design and organization of the human mind and brain? And I would argue that we find considerable evidence for Mars' principle of modular design. There are lots of brain regions that have remarkably um, specific functions that they conduct, like speech and music. Uh, but importantly, not all important mental functions get their own private patch in the brain, and that's an ongoing puzzle to figure out which ones do. Uh, and further, some brain regions are extremely uh, general purpose, and I think figuring out what those regions are doing is a really fascinating puzzle. Um, and something I, I had to take out of the talk because it was too long uh, is a whole other line of work we're just beginning now, asking um, about a whole other domain of cognition that's pretty much not been touched in human cognitive neuroscience. And that is, when you go around in the world, you have a, actually a very rich understanding of the physics of the world. You need this to be able to put a coffee cup on a table in a way that it won't fall over, to know how to pick up um, you know, a, a, a piece of fruit in, a, in the grocery store with making, without making an avalanche of all the fruit. Uh, all, just to, in every, every motor act we perform in the world, we have to have some intuitive idea of the physics of the world that we're acting on. Uh, and so we've been looking at brain regions that are engaged in that kind of intuitive physics. Uh, and basically we find a set of regions, they are not special purpose ones, they do lots of things, and interestingly, they seem to be involved in intuitive physics and also action planning. They've been previously implicated in sort of planning action motor control. And I think sometimes when you find um, things that deviate from extreme specialization, but where there are multiple functions, the particular combination of functions is going to reveal deep insights into the underlying computation. And the idea that motor control uh, or action planning and an understanding of physics might go together, I think is pretty exciting. Um, okay, so I'm out of time. I will just say, in case you want to ask me about it, I had a whole other little mini lobe of the talk in which I sort of kick away the ladder I just climbed up um, by um, showing you some recent computational results that suggest that the original re reason I supposed why we might have these specializations of the brain, namely that each of them is conducting a computationally distinct problem, um, might not be the right reason uh, from some modeling results, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, I'm told I can take a few questions. Yeah. Hi. 
Um, I have a question. Um, so I think for some cases it's known that uh, information flows, you know, there's a hierarchy of centers that analyze more and more complicated data. Is there a hope of seeing the flow of information through the brain? I didn't hear. Is there a hope of what? Seeing the flow of information yeah. through centers? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I would love to be able to see that. It's very hard in humans. With those intracranial electrodes, you have good spatial resolution and beautiful time information. So you can do that, but you have no control over it. Obviously, it's the surgeons who decide where the electrodes go, not the scientists, as it should be. Uh, and so when a patient comes along who happens to have electrodes in the right place and that patient doesn't mind doing your experiment, you get some very, very precious data. But those data are very rare, and otherwise, I think that kind of question is mostly just best approached in animal models. Um, there are other methods like magnetoencephalography that have very good time information, but um, worse spatial information. So those are kind of gray areas. But yeah, those are fundamental questions, but they're uh, tough to answer in humans. Uh, yeah. yeah. You said some of these are uniquely human. I mean, in order to fully justify that, you need to look at it something, the same music, whether... Uh, yeah. Non-human non primates are responding to it. Yeah, so what I, I, I sort of skipped over that too fast. What I mean is that the functions they carry out are functions that are uniquely human, right? So as far as the, you know, the people who look at these things, you know, no animal has anything remotely like human music, right? Birdsong is just a different beast, right? It's, it's not for pleasure, it's for, you know, very, you know, and it's not, um, it's not productive, it's very rigid, it's just, it's not like language, it's not like speech. Uh, and there's no evidence for, you know, anything really like music in animals. So those, that's what I mean by saying those functions are uniquely human. Yeah, so it's a very interesting question how they evolve, right? So, um, so for functions that are shared with animals uh, and monkeys, you can ask that question. Um, let me see if I can find a slide on this. We um, have a paper that's about to come out where we're looking at uh, visual regions of the brain, and we've been comparing them with humans and macaques, and we find uh, tantalizing similarities. Here we go. Um, so this is um, work with, um, come on. Uh, with Rosa Lefer Souza and Bevel Conway, and they had previously shown in monkeys, this is the side of a macaque monkey brain, that there's this systematic uh, parallelism of a set of face patches going down the temporal lobe, color selective patches, and place selective patches in that order, systematically going down the temporal lobe in monkeys. And what we find in humans is that if you look on the ventral surface of the brain, this is a human brain over at the right, you see the same systematic order, faces, color, places. So we think that's too suspicious a coincidence, and that probably means that these regions on the lateral surface migrated around on the bottom surface of the brain in humans. So I think for these kinds of cases, you can, you can make a reasonable guess of the homologies. The deeper question is, is there a homologue in monkeys of the thing that turned into language cortex or music cortex or theory of mind? And there's some possible ways to get at that, but it's very tough and nobody's really done it yet. 